We'll just begin with prayer. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. 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 Praise you, Jesus. 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 We need God to really teach us this precious truth. These are things, many things that we're going to learn are things we're learning for the first time. And believe me, these are so precious and they can bring that big change that our hearts are longing for. But our hearts must be open and ready for God's word. Therefore, let's just ask the Lord to speak to us. Shall we all pray? Oh God, we pray, oh Master, we need you, oh God. 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 Oh, Rabaka, Sarabaka, Rabba, Shidibika, Rabba, Tudabaka, Sidabaka, Tidabaka, Rabba, Niana, Masidam, Tudana, Masidam, Tuda. For grace, oh God, pour out your wisdom and understanding upon us, oh Lord. Make this, oh Lord, theme real in our lives as we look to you with our empty hearts, longing to be filled. In Jesus' name we pray. Before we begin, there's something about the summing up, was it announced this morning? Okay, now there's one part of it that was not announced, which I'd like to ask you all, since you're the first team. Um, if there's going to be, we're not going to tell you what, there's going to be some, some part of the summing up where one of the campus has to come and present something. It may be difficult, it may be easy. We're not going to tell you. But is there anyone saying, I volunteer to do that? It may be difficult. We may have to come up and do something. If you're willing, there's a commitment form. And it says, I agree before the congregation to abide by all the rules and I will stay with it till the end. Any volunteer willing to come and sign? Volunteer, not nominee. Thank you very much. We've just defined consecration. That is all. This is the definition of consecration. We shall begin now. The theme is the beauty of consecration. No. We begin with this. To make it clear, I've got this feeling that many of you think that this camp is a special camp where we're going to recruit servants of God. Consecration, this is a servant of God thing, not for believers. Consecration is not just for servants of God. Right at the outset, we want to make this clear. Consecration is something for every genuine Christian, not just our church, but all through history. Well, from history, we understand that even song composers, say for example, Fanny Crosby. She's the blind composer who composed, I am thine, O Lord, draw me nearer. And one of the verses is, consecrate me now to thy service, Lord. And there is Frances Ridley, have a go. And she sang, take my life and let it be. She was born in Worcestershire and had a great battle as a young adult with this theme of consecration. She struggled a lot to consecrate her life. But when the Lord finally gave her victory, they said more than all her songs, it was in her daily life that they were able to see this theme of consecration represented. But not just song composers, even presidents of the USA. George Washington, the first president of the USA, in his presidential speech, he made this consecration and Hoover Herbert Clark, the 31st president of the USA, he said, what I'm going to do, this role that I'm going to play is not an ordinary role for an American citizen. Therefore, I make my dedication and consecration to God. And Richard Nixon, the 37th president of the USA, also used this term. Well, just not song composers and presidents, even artists like Mary Artemisia Lathbury, she was born in New York, a splendid artist. One day the Lord told her, My daughter, I want you to consecrate your beautiful gift to me. Charles Finney said, This theme of entire sanctification and consecration 
is as old as the Bible itself. So if this is something that so many Christians belonging to so many other churches have enjoyed and experienced, I think we must not lose out. So what we are going to study is something very precious. We are going to take the grand old theme of consecration from the lives of saints in history and even study it in our modern time. And let me make a statement which is gospel truth. It is impossible for a Christian to make any progress without consecration. So, we shall begin our study on consecration. Now, in session one, we're going to understand the concept, not definition. Consecration is not something that we can define. It's a concept, it's a theme that we are seeking to develop. And in session two, we shall understand the consecration of a believer. And in session three, we will understand the consecration of a servant of God and conclude with the beauty of consecration. In session one, we will actually see the concept of consecration and the roots in Hebrew, that is the Hebrew roots of this word consecration. And finally, Old Testament consecration. Now this is what we are going to study in this session. So let me begin. What do you think of consecration? What, when I mention this word consecration, what are the words that come into your head? It opens up a mental file of many synonyms. What, what words do you think of when I think of consecration? Separation, education, dedication, devotion, set apart, sanctification. Okay, so for the word consecrate, you get dedicate. Well, I've got a few words. Devote, dedicate, surrender, hallow, sanctify. Don't forget bishop, holy communion, servant of God. Well, these are you know, the first words that pop up in people's heads. All these are words that I would say center around this theme, this concept. But if there's a word that can come very close to it, it is consecrate. This word consecrate is from a Middle English word, 14th century. And we're, going to, we're just going to start off with this basic definition. Now if you look at this table here, I've got a load of objects here. But I pick up one and I put it aside. Now when I said to pick it up and put it aside, what I have done is to consecrate it or set it apart. When I do that, I'm doing it for a purpose. Now, let us see the definition, the basic definition of Christian consecration. It is being set apart or dedicated to God for his use. Now that's the simple basic definition. And as we develop this concept, we will start understanding it more. But there's, there's so much. In fact, the heart of God is in this whole theme. So let us now ask three questions. Before that, I'll just read a statement made by a man called Miller. He said, Consecration is handing God a blank sheet with your name signed at the bottom. Lord, you fill it up. I have signed. So that's consecration. Now, let's try and understand this a little more. There are some three questions, three basic questions. If I make a consecration, can I say, I consecrate myself to doing the projector in the church. I consecrate myself for the music ministry. Can we make our consecration to something or to someone? And this whole idea of consecration, where does it begin? Does it begin with the pastor in charge of your church? Does he say you are consecrated? Or do you consecrate yourself or does God come and consecrate us? Where does it begin? 
Thirdly, all right, if we have accepted everything so far, what must we consecrate? Do we consecrate our things? Please, don't tell me we must consecrate our family. No, we can't do that. That's for servants of God. Or do we consecrate ourselves? What is this whole thing about consecration? Now, these are three questions we'd like to deal with. First of all, to whom or to what? According to the Bible in Exodus 32, 29, we read, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord. True consecration is made to the Lord. You hand him the blank paper. You don't say, fill it up and say, Lord, I consecrate myself for this particular thing. When servants of God join the ministry, now that's session three, the first thing that they are asked, are you willing to go anywhere? Are you willing to do anything for Jesus? Oh, no, no, I'm willing only to preach. Obviously, then you're consecrating yourself for something. That's not consecration. Consecration is saying, Lord, I give myself to you. A blank piece of paper with my name signed at the bottom. So we make our consecration to the Lord and not to any particular ministry. Even St. Paul says, yield yourselves unto God. Secondly, who initiates this consecration? Let us understand Consecration, this whole theme of consecration begins with God himself. First of all, he consecrates us. He spoke to Jeremiah and he said, I have consecrated you. When God is made that clear, then as an echo of what he did, we consecrate ourselves to him. So there are two basic elements. First of all, he consecrated us. St. Paul says, God has a predetermined plan for us. Every one of us seated here, we are not just an accident of nature. We were not born by the will of our parents. We are here according to the will of God, according to a predetermined plan of God. And God has a plan. He has consecrated us for that. And now it is our duty and our responsibility to find that out, abide in the word of God and live in obedience to that consecration in our everyday life. In John 17, Jesus said, I consecrate myself. St. Paul says, I die daily, meaning, Lord, not my will, but your will. That is daily surrender to this consecration. Well, St. Paul also says, I run to obtain, I run that I may apprehend, take hold of the very reason why Jesus took hold of me. He took hold of me for a reason. Now I'm going after that, not after something else. So when we understand this, he already consecrated me and now I keep consecrating myself. Then the more I surrender, the more I draw close to him, consecration takes place in stages. Now the third question, what must we consecrate? In the Old Testament, you find the children of Israel, they consecrated their vessels and articles of silver and gold and bronze, their cattle, their fields, their houses. If they went for a war, the spoils of war, their gain, they consecrated. Well, the whole nation of Israel was consecrated. The priests were consecrated. The Levites, the firstborn, whatever they had, their feast days, their temples, anything, everything. So also, we in the New Testament, we consecrate anything and everything. We consecrate ourselves and all that belongs to us. And so we've answered these three basic questions to understand this concept, but you've not understood anything so far. Now, what we must understand, consecration is really a miracle of grace. How can you or I, how can we give anything to God? Do you know what the Bible says? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell there. There is nothing that belongs to us. I just said consecration is giving what belongs to us to God. But there's nothing that belongs to us anyway. In First Chronicles 29.14 we read that 
all things come from God and of his own have we returned to him. Everything we have belongs to God. It doesn't belong to us. There is nothing that you possess to say, Lord, I have this thing. I've decided to consecrate it to you. And God will say, it already is mine. I am the one who gave it to you. So when we understand that we are really humbled and we realize consecration is in four humbling steps. God is the owner of all. He gave it to me. Now I give it back to him and he receives it from me. Now why does he go, let us go through this experiment. If I give you a simple analogy. In your, in your Sunday school, sometimes parents, they give the children a few coins. This is for offering. How many parents do that? What do you do? You tell them to go and put it in the box because the pastor needs some money. No, what do you do? What do you say? It's for the Lord. Where did you get the money from? You say we are giving it to the Lord. Looks like you're doing God, you know, you're giving something to God. But who gave it to you? God gave it to you. So why do you give it back to him? No, what we are trying to do, we are trying to develop, inculcate a certain habit in our children the this thing of giving learn to give give to the lord but we have nothing to give it all came from him he gives it to us in order that we give it back to him he has not given us anything to keep it for ourselves consecration is nothing but returning to the lord what already belongs to him which he gave to us now if you can look at the screen. This thing about consecration cannot be fully understood from the English Bible because this consecration, this word consecration, it occurs many times in the Old Testament, but wherever it occurs, it's not the same Hebrew word being used each time. In the English Bible, it's consecrate, consecration, and so on. But if you go to the Old Testament, see the Hebrew language. It's not just one Old Testament Hebrew word being used. Quite a few words are being used. And we must get familiar with these five words. You'll be as familiar with these words by the end of this camp as you are with the names of the members of your own family. So you might as well begin now. I can't say I can really pronounce it as a Jew would, but the A should be pronounced as an O. So it will be Kodash, Mole, Nazor, Moshak, and Koram. But it's a bit awkward to go on like that. And so we'll just pronounce it as we read it. Kadash, not male. We'll pronounce that as Mole, Nazar, Mashak, and Karam. Okay, can we just, just do it a little, just to wake the sleeping ones up? Right, Kodosh is easy, isn't it? Okay, Kadosh, Mole, Nazar, Majak, Karam. Each of these words are used in the Old Testament to mean consecration. And what we are going to do is try to understand the meaning of these words one by one. And each word will make us understand this theme of consecration a little more. Remember, session one is all about the concept of consecration. So let's just look at that first word, kadash. What is the meaning of kadash? Kadash has six letters. Of them, three stand out. Q-D-S. This is the root of this word. Q-D-S. And the essence, the meaning of Q-D-S. What? Something that is being used for a secular purpose, to withhold it from that secular purpose and to set it apart exclusively. You're transferring it into God's possession for His exclusive use. That's the root, QDS. If I have to give an example, suppose, you know, these worker sisters sometimes go shopping and they go and buy some vessels. They bring it to the faith home and they put it all on the table. Then they pick out two vessels and say, this is for Holy Communion. What do they do? What do you imagine they would do? They would keep it in a separate place and use it 
how many times a week once a month do you think they would just take it and use it for any old thing no you know that this is withheld from ordinary use now it has been set aside specifically for god's use now that's the root qds and this qds is used in a few other hebrew words as you can see kadosh kadash kodesh and mikdash all these are hebrew words kadosh means holy i am the lord who is kadosh i am holy i am kadash i sanctify you i stay in kodesh the most holy place make me a mikdash make me a sanctuary meaning a consecrated place so this qds everywhere means something that is withheld from ordinary use set apart for god's use is there any other word that gives you this idea of setting apart it's the word sanctify sanctify means being set apart unto the lord so the first word kadosh or kadash for consecration gives us the idea of holiness a consecration consecration therefore develops holiness in us the moment something is set apart for god it's no longer for sacred uh, uh, secular or ordinary use it's set apart for god immediately that thing becomes sacred you know there is nothing please note this there is nothing naturally sacred there are things which are naturally clean there are things which are naturally unclean but there is nothing naturally sacred a thing becomes sacred not because it is clean or unclean but because it is set apart for god and according to the bible when something was set apart for god god took it very seriously thereafter he claimed that that would be his dear young adults we have consecrated ourselves kadash we have consecrated ourselves for the lord every one of us so when we say lord lead us not into temptation and then we deliberately go and watch entertainment where there is temptation what are we doing we are profaning our consecration now that is called desecration there is in us an inherent nature that rebels against our own consecration it's the spirit of jezebel inside us that rebels against what god has set us apart for so we must always remember i am kadash i am consecrated the second hebrew word is mole the literal meaning of this word mole is to fill the hand or to give with open hands now if you if you ask a child can i have some sweets from that bag and the child brings out one and reluctantly gives you maybe the wrapper then you'll know okay 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 i'm not going to take you sweet but if the child actually digs a hand right into the bag and brings a whole bunch out what would you say she's willingly wholeheartedly giving it this the measure of one's hand is nothing but the measure of one's heart so this word mole in the old testament is used for consecration it's there in the bible there are few verses also in your syllabus but this makes us understand if we make a consecration if we make a kadash consecration it must also be mole meaning there must be a willingness consecration is always a willing consecration see for example in this tabernacle in the old testament who gave the material to make this tabernacle the israelites but do you know one thing amazing about this moses told the people give for this construction the bible tells us they gave so much that moses had to actually stop them please can you stop giving because they were so willing to give for the house of god for the construction of god's house now that's called mole consecration 
it must always be a willing consecration. It is our choice. Therefore, understand, consecration cannot be imposed on anyone. No servant of God can come and tell you, all right, you better consecrate this. They may tell you, but they can't force you because consecration has to be a wholehearted consecration, mole consecration. Look at the statement made by Brooke Foss Westcott. He says, the mark of a saint is not perfection, but consecration. A saint is not a man without faults, but a man who has surrendered himself without condition, given himself without reserve to God. Now the third word that is used for consecration is Nazar. As you can see, N-A-Z-A-R, this word is used for consecration, but this is the word used also in the Bible for Nazarite. We will study this later, the Nazarite consecration. But this word Nazar literally means to separate. You know, in the Old Testament, Israel was surrounded by many nations and many of these nations were incorporating many immoral activities as part of their religious ceremony. God was totally against that and therefore told Israel, separate yourselves. And this is why St. Paul also often told the church, the believers, keep yourself separate from sinners, separate from unbelievers. We have nothing to do with them because we are a separated people. To be separated from the world, the things of this world, the fashions of this world, that is the meaning of Nazar. Now, when we make the separation, it has its effects in our lives. If I must give an illustration, there was a concert violinist who was performing in New York in the Carnegie Hall. And she was so brilliant that people used to ask her, how did you ever come to such brilliance in your performance? She said two words. She said, it was by planned neglect. I plan to neglect anything that got in the way of my goal. So if there is anything that comes in your way, plan to neglect it. Because we have a goal, we have a role, and we must therefore make this consecration, Nazar consecration. When we make this, like the Nazarite, there will obviously be some kind of an outward sign that we have made it. What was the outward sign for a Nazarite? His long hair. His long hair was an outward token of his inward consecration. So if we have made a consecration to the Lord, there will be some kind of, you know, a sign on the outside. People will know, oh, this person is consecrated to the Lord. But there's sometimes there's no outward sign. We have secret Christians inside the church also. There's no outward sign that this person is even saved. But a consecrated person, a Nazar person, will surely experience this outward sign in his life. Well, the next word is mojak. And the meaning of this word is to anoint or to smear. Anoint a person from the Strong's Concordance. The, this implies putting an anointing on a person to set him apart for a ministry. Or this refers to the anointing that we receive for consecration. This is the anointing that in the Old Testament, the, the priests and the Levites, the kings, the prophets, they all receive from the Lord. Even so in our lives, there is an anointing that consecrates us. Now, the last word for consecration is karam. Now, this is an important word. The literal meaning of karam is to destroy. And it is the same word, karam, that is used for consecration in the Bible. Now, example, Leviticus 27, 28 says, Every devoted thing is most holy, karam, unto the Lord. What does this mean? When something is consecrated, devoted to the Lord, it is devoted for destruction. Let me explain. When it is given to the Lord, it is given. It is given and cannot be redeemed and used again for a secular purpose. 
once a pot or a vessel was consecrated to the Lord, but after a while it outlived its usefulness. It could not be once again used for a secular purpose. That pot was consecrated. That pot was haram unto the Lord. If it's not going to be used in service, it has to be destroyed. Therefore, a consecration is for life. It is meant only for the Lord. It's meant forever. Now that is the karam aspect of consecration. If an animal was consecrated for the Lord, then that animal could not be restored to the flock. It had to be sacrificed unto the Lord. This implies a surrender to, to death, a willingness to die. In consecration, there's a willingness to die. When we, when we talk of this willingness to die, I'm reminded of the, the Japanese pilots. We've heard of the kamikaze, the Japanese pilots who flew their planes into American targets and blew up several ships you must have heard of the Pearl Harbor and how it actually brought the U.S. into World War II. These pilots, they surrendered themselves to death. You know what they actually did? While they were alive, their funeral service was conducted. They would have a meeting where they would lie down. The whole service was conducted and then they got up. But though they got up, they're not alive, they're dead. They, have been, they, are, they are karam. They have given themselves over to death. They would get into their plane and pull the hood over them. And that hood had a permanent seal. Once you pull it over you, that's it. It's your coffin. You can't get out. And that plane is filled with gasoline or bombs or whatever. And they actually fly their planes into the targets. That is where this whole theme of suicide bombing started. These Japanese pilots. And when they flew their planes... The destruction was severe. The pictures that you see are the pictures of Pearl Harbor and what havoc was wrought through these Japanese pilots. So Karam is that willingness. And if you look at Jesus, when he consecrated himself, he had Kadash and Mole and he had Nazar, he had Mashak, he had Karam. He gave himself to die. He didn't say, I, I'm willing to serve the Lord, but I'm not willing to die. There was a willingness to die. Also, if you look at the life of Jephthah, you know, the story of Jephthah, he went for war and he told the Lord, Lord, when I come back from war, if you've given me victory, anything that comes from my house first, I will offer it to you. And when he came back, whom did he see? His daughter. And what did he do? Karam. I've, I've, oh, I've opened my mouth. But I'm sure we would be a little more clever. You know what would he have said? Hang on. I didn't expect my daughter. Let me go back. Now what did I say? I said God anything. A God I, I meant thing. So I'll bypass her. But let me see what other thing I see. Oh I saw that chair. I'll give that chair to the house of God. I, I, I offer it for a burnt offering. Jephthah didn't do that. We are clever people, like the Pharisees. If you read your Bible today, you must have read a word, Koban, in Mark. You know what? Jesus was against this, totally against this practice of saying Koban. Because, see, if there was a young man with a lot of money, and his father, he came to him and said, I need some of your money. This young man didn't want to part with his money. He didn't know what to do. So the Pharisees devised a method. Say it is Korban. When you say Korban, it means that is devoted, consecrated to the Lord. I can't use it for secular purpose, Daddy. I'm sorry. I really want to help you. You know, Dad, I know I can. I just feel for you. Unfortunately, this belongs to the Lord and I can't help you. I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry. And Dad, you know these old people, they really believe you. And the moment he goes away, he uses it for himself. So they were actually going against the practice of karam by using the word koban. Jesus was against it. There's one more meaning for this word karam and it means accursed. Whatever is consecrated is accursed. Do you understand that? Whatever is consecrated 
is accursed. How do you understand that? It's best understood from the story of Achan. If you remember the story of Achan, we see how God said, I'll just read it from the Bible. And ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest you make yourselves accursed. When you take of that accursed thing and you make the camp of Israel a curse, but what should you do? All the silver and the gold and the vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. Therefore they shall come into the treasury of the Lord. Don't go and touch it. A curse will come upon you. It belongs to the Lord. Achan's sin was not theft. It was sacrilege. We know of Ananias and Sapphira. They withheld what should have gone to the Lord. They were punished with death. Even us, dear children of God, what belongs to God, we must understand. For example, our tithes. What exactly is this meaning behind our tithes? You know, when man began to work in the Garden of Eden, his work was a pleasure to him. But after the curse, he's working, but his work doesn't bring happiness. So many of you know, your work life is just such a burden to you. That's part of the curse. That was not how God intended it. But then, the tithes represents that curse. And giving away our tithes is giving away that curse to the Lord. In fact, there are many poor believers. You know, recently there was a poor believer. His bank balance has come right up, right to zero. He doesn't have anything. And whatever he has, he, he said, these are my tithes. So I knew what I would do. I prayed for it and I said, brother, this blessing is yours. But I'm returning the money to you. I know you're going to protest. But I'm telling you, I have prayed for you. You've got the blessing. Now take the money and happily use it. But he didn't say, oh, thank you so much. You're so kind. I've got the blessing and the money. This is a double blessing. You know what? He started crying. He said, brother, please. From the beginning, I have never stopped giving to the Lord. And I must give to the Lord. He didn't think of himself. He knew that money belonged to the Lord. So that karam aspect was found in him. So we also must have that. So if you put all these words together, Kadash and Mole and Nazar and Majak and Karam, putting them all together, this is the meaning of consecration. First of all, Kadash. We tell from secular use, set apart for God's use. Mole, willingly giving yourself to the Lord. Thirdly, Nazar, separating yourself from the world. And fourthly, Majak, receiving an anointing for this. And lastly, it is Karam, being faithful unto the end. Now when we make such a consecration with all these different aspects in it, when you pray, this is what you'll say, Lord, a consecrated prayer, I am willing, O Lord, to receive what you give, to lack what you withhold, to give up what you take from me, to suffer what you permit for me, to be what you want me to be, to do what you command, to go where you send me. This is true consecration. You can see what a surrender is in this prayer. So this is the basic essence of consecration, the concept of consecration. Now, we are going to understand consecration in the Old Testament. The reason we are going to study consecration in the Old Testament in session 1 is because consecration is very much an Old Testament theme. The Israelites were a consecrated people as a nation. They were holiness unto the Lord. Their consecration was so important to them. It was a covenant they made with God. They couldn't keep themselves back from it. It was too important to them. And you know, as part of this consecration, very often they had to do some washing, either washing themselves or their clothes or their vessels. Water was quite scarce there. So whenever they did this washing as part of their consecration, immediately they knew something big is going to happen. God is going to give me a new start. They, they were very keen on their consecration. So under this Old Testament consecration, we're going to briefly look at four kinds of Old Testament consecration. Namely, the consecration of the Nazarite, 
the consecration of the Rechabite, the consecration of the Levite, and the consecration of the firstborn male, not mole. This is the English word, the consecration of the firstborn male. Now, we will just look at them briefly. There's a lot of detail that you could study, but we do not have the time to cover everything. So let's just look at the first one, the consecration of the Nazarite. We find much of it in Numbers chapter 6. These Nazarites, they could be anybody. There was no tribal restriction like in the case of the priests. They should come from the tribe of Levi. The Nazarite could be anyone, man or woman, rich or poor, slave or owner, anyone. A Nazarite could be anyone. But because of his consecration, there were three stipulations. First of all, he would not touch anything that pertained to the grape. No wine at all. Secondly, he would not shave his beard or cut his hair. Thirdly, he would not go near a dead body. So, please remember these three conditions. What are they? No wine, no haircut, no dead body. Now, as long as he kept these three, it would give him, make him something special. For example, when we think of Samson, we remember, as part of his consecration, no wine, no haircut, no going near a dead body. What did it do to him? It gave him immense strength. So this is what consecration does to a Nazarite. Now, when a Nazarite did this, his consecration, if you compare with the high priest, it's, it's kind of similar to that. So it actually brought the Nazarite right up to the level of a ruler or a high priest. His Nazarite consecration was somewhere between 30 to 100 days. That was the kind of a period. But really, there were three Nazarites in the Bible who were Nazarites for life. Do you know their names? Jesus. John the Baptist. Samson. Well, you've got two right there. Jesus was not a Nazarite. If he were a Nazarite, Jesus would not raise the dead because he wouldn't be able to approach a dead body. And Jesus did change water to wine. A Nazarite could not go anywhere near grape juice. Well, it was Samuel. Samuel, Samson, and John the Baptist were Nazarites. Now, these three were chosen before their, before their birth. From their mother's womb, they were chosen to be Nazarites. And they were meant to be Nazarites for life. Now, actually in Israel, there were many other Nazarites too. Their names are not given, but the Bible does tell us there were other Nazarites. Now, there was a purpose. There was a purpose in choosing these Nazarites. Many had the nature of a Nazarite. Even Joseph, the Bible says he was separate from his brethren. That word separate is Nazar. So there were many, many, many Nazarites in the Bible. Now why did God raise up these Nazarites? There was a very definite purpose. Israel as a nation had a nature. They, the Bible itself says they were bent to backsliding. They would attend a camp and three weeks later they would, be, they would just go right back. This was Israel's nature. So every time you looked at Israel, they were in darkness. They were like people straining against a fence, hoping to have a chance to go back into the world. They were constantly doing this. So God raised up Nazarites in Israel, like a light switched on in darkness. When the people saw the Nazarites and their life, the way they kept themselves from wine and the, their consecration, immediately the Israelites would see, Oh, that's the standard which I need. A Nazarite was nothing but the voice of God speaking to the people saying, this is how I want you to be. But do you know what the Israelites did according to the Bible? Instead of looking at the Nazarite and saying, God, I wish I could come up to his standard. What did he do? The Israelite, they went and forced the Nazarites to drink wine. 
they gave them wine and reduced them down to their own standard and this is what is happening everywhere today if you see someone of a better spiritual standard instead of saying god i wish i could be like that person instead we form a group and start criticizing that person saying oh they're trying to be super spiritual well some people are trying to be we'll see that later but i'm saying we must not be like the israelites forcing the nazarites to drink wine when israelites did that god was very grieved now this wine the nazarite would not drink even ordinary wine he would not drink alcoholic wine well no israelite would but the nazarite wouldn't even drink ordinary wine spiritually wine sp- speaks of happiness or pleasure a nazarite would say my pleasure is god i i divorce myself from anything else i want to find real happiness only in my god some people say i i don't want sinful pleasure but i don't mind anything else but a nazarite would say my joy comes from the lord secondly the razor would not come on his head this word nazar is used for consecration it's also used in hebrew for crown and the bible says because of our sin the crown falls from the head in other words the razor takes away the crown the razor cuts off the hair and we know that happened to samson this razor can speak of sin sin in the mind and immediately we lose our strength the third thing the nazarite could not do he could not approach a dead body that didn't seem to be too hard a stipulation except when it came to burying your own relations he wouldn't be able to do it it speaks of a separation even from the family where you would not defile yourself even for relatives sometimes you come across a situation where you have to take a decision should i go or should i not go a nazarite would keep his purity his his consecration was important to him so physically pure that is not approaching a dead body purity in the mind no razor shall come upon my head and the joy of the lord alone in my heart no wine it shows body soul spirit consecrated for the lord of all these nazarites these three were the best and of these three john the baptist was the best he was the forerunner of jesus and jesus said of all the people born of women there's no one greater than john the baptist but then what did he say after that he said the smallest believer in new jerusalem is greater than john the baptist meaning our standard has to exceed the standard of john the baptist if we must be in new jerusalem or go when jesus comes this is the nazarite consecration then comes the second one which is the rechabite consecration not much to say on that today but these rechabites were a, a group of people they came from the family of the kenites they were the sons children of rechab and they did have some connection with israel you know saul was very kind to the kenites and the bible says that moses married a kenite wife so there was some connection with the kenites now jonadab the father of these rechabites normally the rechabites could abide by they had their own rules but jonadab told them you must not drink wine nor must you live in settled houses you must live like nomads spiritually of course again saying no to the pleasures of this world and choosing the life of a nomad or faith life the life of a pilgrim and a stranger this was a rechabite consecration spiritually it has to be in us too and remember consecration it must come from the heart it must be a willing consecration and it must be karam it must not be something for a while we must offer ourselves to be like that until death the third consecration was the levitical consecration of the old testament now that picture is a picture a distant view of the tabernacle now a ringside view of the tabernacle and finally the high priest with those 12 stones on his chest with the names of the scri- the, the tribes on them in this as part of this levitical consecration we find from the israelites we see a group one tribe called the levites were taken from them the kohathites and from the kohathites the family of aaron the family of aaron aaron was the high priest his sons were the priests now they were in charge of the tabernacle and the levites were the ones who were helping them so they would assist them the levites were like the a uh, uh, a gift 
to the priests to help in the ministry. But not all Israelites. A common Israelite could not encroach upon the sacred space that was called the tabernacle, set apart for the Lord himself. Only those who were consecrated. For this consecration ceremony, a ram of consecration was offered. And to represent how this Levite or this priest, this priest, this high priest, these priests would listen to the voice of God, work for the Lord and walk in the ways of God. The blood had to be upon the right ear, the right thumb and the big or the great toe of the right foot. Meaning they would hear God's voice and do the ministry. They would work for the Lord and walk in the ways of God. Now This was their consecration because of which even an ordinary Levite, he had no territorial possession. God was supposed to be his possession and separate cities were set apart for them. No time to go into those details. Fourthly, the consecration of the firstborn male. In the Old Testament, God was very um, particular about this. Let me just read it from the Bible. The Bible says, Set apart or consecrate every firstborn male for me. Every firstborn male offspring among the Israelites is mine, whether human or animal. Why did God say this? Because on the day of that final plague in Egypt, when God smote the firstborn of Egypt, that same day, God spared the firstborn in Israel. Look, the time when the firstborn of Egypt was dying, that same day, the firstborn of Israel was actually being preserved, protected by the blood. What happened after that? God said, For all the firstborn are mine. On the day that I struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I consecrated for my own all the firstborn in Israel, both of man and of beast. They shall be mine. I am the Lord. He didn't just say it as a one-off statement. Thereafter, he kept reminding them again and again, The firstborn of thy sons shalt thou give unto me. For all the firstborn of the children of Israel are mine, both of man and beast. On the day that I smote every firstborn in the land of Egypt, I sanctified, I consecrated them for myself. So also, in the New Testament, our firstborn belongs to the Lord. And we ourselves as a church, from the day we receive the Holy Spirit, according to Hebrews 12.23, we are called the church of the firstborn. Now, there is a question for us. What makes consecration hard? I mean, it hasn't been very pleasant to hear so long, is it? Ha! <sighs> what really makes consecration hard? You know, every human being operates on the principle of selfishness, self-ownership. Every human being by nature, you don't have to choose to be like that. You are like that. I am like that. We are selfish people by nature. By people, we love to receive. We love to retain. We love to just keep for ourselves. But consecration is directly opposite. Contrary to that, it is... What is directly opposite to that? Hey, 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 hey. Listen, what's the opposite of selfishness? We are all human. We love to keep to ourselves. Consecration is? Willingly giving it. All right, okay. I have to consecrate it. All right, okay, here. Take it. That's not consecration. That's the most unwilling giving. We are all selfish people. And when God starts working on us, we become unwillingly selfish. We are still selfish, but unwilling. Oh God, I don't know, I'm like this, I'm all the time keeping. Oh, I don't like people to touch me, I don't like to give away. That's human nature. That's our spiritual standard at the moment. We are unwillingly selfish. Or we are kind of reluctantly willing to consecrate. But true consecration is willingly, joyfully giving. So we are the biggest problem. The root of self within a man is against the spirit. Oswald Chambers puts it beautifully. He says, the essence of consecration is the giving up of our rights to ourselves. 
who would do that? That means willing to be a slave. The root is the strength of a tree. And this root of sin or self, that majak aspect, that anointing is the one that breaks that. And a person who really gets victory, what happens? He feels within himself a big change. He begins to gravitate towards what he once hated. Have you experienced that change? You know, because of the self within us, the self does not want to lose its right to ownership. The self does not want to lose the applause of its friends. The self is so full of unbelief, it does not want to risk everything in God's hands. But it is the anointing that deals with that and breaks it and we begin to love to give. Anyone had that experience where you once you hated to give something and then later you found yourself liking to give it? All right, we'll have to experience it one day because that's a sign of spiritual growth because consecration is everything about spirituality and where we did not want to give it and then finally joyfully gave it. That is a sign of spiritual growth. Now, in conclusion for session one is a very important thing and that is the pride of consecration. Now, you know, this theme of consecration. Now, I, I really want to put this across. Kadash means to set apart. The essence of consecrate is to set apart. It means um, being different or exclusive. But remember, it is exclusive to God. But the problem is because we are still selfish people, we set ourselves apart and then we start thinking I am different, I'm, I'm a bit special now, I, I'm not normal like the others, I'm different. You know, when you make a consecration, be careful. Make it in the will of God alone. If you're not sure, please get the counsel of servants of God. Do it prayerfully because any consecration made in the self, it damages the person and damages others' lives also. Now, one saintly sister said, Consecrate your consecrations. You know what she meant. You know, when we make a consecration, that can become our pride. We can become proud of our consecration. That means it's, this consecration has become an idol. So that sister said, don't let it become your idol. You put that also on the altar. As an example, suppose you just love table tennis. There's nothing wrong with table tennis, but you find it's occupying your dreams, your desires, your time and everything. And then one day the sweet voice of the Lord appeals to your willing heart and says, My son, my daughter, I know how much you love me. Put your Isaac on the altar. This consecration now becomes part of your life. So immediately you see there's an altar. And God is saying, consecrate your table tennis. So you obey and you consecrate it. Now, you kind of given up playing. After a while, somebody comes up to you and say, how's the table tennis going? Oh no, I don't do it anymore. You don't play table tennis. I heard you were a champ. I was. I think I still am. But I, uh, I have consecrated it. What do you mean consecrated? Now I've stopped because, you know, God doesn't want, really, I can't believe it. Why can't you believe it? It's not easy, you know. It's not easy to give up things like that. Wow. And then you go and tell a few other people and they all say, Wow, you've given up your table tennis. How did you do that? So what happens? Your table tennis has become a little idol and you've developed a little shrine and you've got your devotees coming and worshipping you. Wow, you've given up your table tennis. And what happens? You feel your consecration has now made you special. God says, Aha. That's not why I asked you to consecrate your table tennis. I told you to consecrate it so that attachment to it should go. But now it's become an idol. So what do you do with that consecration now? God says, take your consecration and consecrate it. Now that is the meaning of consecrate your consecrations. Put your consecration on the altar. Don't let it become your idol. Don't worship your own consecration. You know, say for example, you consecrate your clothes. Okay. 
I won't wear grey. Now, if you make your consecration, make it. If you say, I'm going to only wear simple clothes, praise God, that's a good consecration. But after that, you start thinking about your consecration, meditating on your consecration. And when you step out in your house and come to church and say, look everybody, how simple I am. I'm consecrated. Everyone come and worship me. If you start becoming conscious of yourself, comparing yourself with somebody else and say, oh gosh, they are more simple than I am. I have to become more. Con-. You know, the moment you start comparing, you're making an idol of your consecration. That's not consecration. Consecration is done out of love. It's nothing but a step of obedience. Some people make consecration to become better. You don't improve your life at all. You, you don't become more spiritual because you're consecrated. It doesn't make you exclusive. Don't ever use consecration. You know, it's not an act of desperation. It's an act of love. It's not a garment of sackcloth. It's a garment of beauty. And we must not think that we can use this consecration to make God answer our prayers or make us more spiritual or be ready for the coming of the Lord. That's not the attitude. We can really go down the wrong track in this whole idea of consecration. The legalistic keeping of consecration where we do it all of the self. And the, you know, some people, they say consecration is kadash, it makes me holy. And they become so conscious of their holiness. That's not consecration. They are not interested in consecrating themselves to the Lord, they're interested in their own whiteness. They're worshipping themselves. I am better than thou. And it makes them spiritually blind. The Pharisees were like that. The Pharisees, you know, no, no, I, I, I can't touch that. I have to first wash my hands. Not, not cold water. I need hot water. And I need a towel. Oh, no, no, no only white towel. And no, no, I have to wipe my right hand first. They would keep all these rules and by that they felt others couldn't keep these rules and I can keep it. I am better than thou. I tell you, Jesus hates it. He hates it. He loved the sinners, but he hated the proud Pharisees. He said they're going to hell. This wrong idea of consecration can really take us away, so far away from the Lord, it can lead to extreme blindness. Now I really emphasize this because there was one particular man who developed this theme of consecration for his own life. He thought he was doing the will of God. He thought he was performing an act of consecration. There was nobody who could touch him, nobody who could correct him, nobody who could talk him out of his adamant attitude. And he developed such a hardened attitude that he finally indulged in the greatest, most barbaric pogrom the annihilation of the Jews. And this man, Adolf Hitler, said, This is my consecration. I am doing God's will. And as an act of service to God, I'm going to slaughter the Jews. Can you see how blind he became? And that's how blind we can become by the pride of consecration. There's no room for pride, in fact. Because the Greek word for consecration in the New Testament is tepaino. And it means making low, abasing. Because consecration really is a shameful thing. Look at the Nazarite. He had to have long hair. But what did the Bible say? To have long hair is a shameful thing for a man. So he willingly took that shame upon himself. It didn't make him better. He took that shame upon himself, willing for the Lord. Consecration is, I am willing to be reproached. It doesn't make you better or more spiritual. Therefore, let us not have a wrong attitude in this act of consecration. We will study more about the beauty of consecration as we go on. And with this, we have really ended this session. We have developed the concept of consecration. Please remember those five words because you will come across those five words again and again in your sessions. What are the words? Kadash. Mole, Naza, Mashak, Karam. First word means, Kadash means, well you can say it's holiness. It's not being used for secular use, used for God's use. Mole means willingly doing it. Naza, separate from the world. Fourthly, Mashak, meaning an anointing for that consecration. And lastly, Karam, giving, it to you, giving yourself to God for life. A total surrender for life. May God really... Help us. Shall we all stand?